So now I'm going to hand over to Simon Gibson, our Chief Investment Officer, who will um, take you through this morning's presentation, and I'll rejoin you later for a Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. And yes, indeed, welcome to everybody. We do appreciate you joining us. Most importantly, we really trust everybody as well. Uh, we do uh, mean that and we are having those conversations across the country with so many people, friends, family and clients. So I do hope everybody is well. I can also reassure you, for those that might have been worried, that unlike the news report on the BBC website yesterday, none of today's presenters are presenting from the Bath. I would like to talk briefly about Mattioli Woods. We have uh, around 540 of our colleagues currently working from home, and I stress that they are working from home. We currently have around about 80 of our colleagues who are self-isolating, uh, one or two unwell, uh, one or two at risk and under the 12-week rule. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, we are operating strongly as a business and our staff well-being is being taken extremely seriously. We've had many conversations and the use of modern technology has been a real boon. It also proves that our business continuity planning has, has worked very well. Consultants are calling clients and if you haven't been called already by your consultant, you will be soon. They are getting around everybody as soon as they can to check in with them. And again, the first question is, how are you? This is really important. We are continuing to work. The government, as you may have read, have banned, uh, or, sorry, not banned, but they've said that MOTs do not have to be carried out on vehicles for the next six months or so. From our perspective, we want to make sure that we are still around. And indeed, we think now is the best time to have your own personal finances looked over. Uh, if not now, then when? All of the above means that we are still delivering a full service to clients across the country. Uh, we are open for business. Sadly, this full service does include assisting two families whose loved ones have died with COVID-19 related illnesses. And of course, whilst we send our condolences to them, uh, we realise there may be more bad news yet to come. I now quickly like to introduce our first speaker, Richard Smith. Richard is an investment manager in Newmarket. And I'd just like to start with a quick quote from Franklin D. Roosevelt, who in 1933, in the depths of the depression, not a circumstance we find ourselves in today, that was a very economic issue, which had been going on for four years. He famously uh, gave a, a, a speech at his inauguration. He said, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror, which paralyzes needed efforts to convert retreat into advance. So far, it doesn't sound great, does it? And he went on to say, in every dark hour of our national life, a leadership of frankness and of vigor has met with that understanding and support of the people themselves, which is essential to victory. And I'm convinced you will again give that support to leadership in these critical days. I think his words uh, were pretty powerful then, but they actually resonate still today. And so without further ado, let's pass on to Richard Smith, who will talk you through where we are. Richard. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for that uh, introduction, Simon. Um, I'm going to provide an update on what's been happening in financial markets. And inevitably, what that means is that I'm going to talk about uh, the coronavirus and um, what it's, the impact that it's been having. Um, I'm then going to touch a bit um, on what I think is going to happen next in markets um, and also discuss what we at Mattier Woods have been doing in response to this uh, crisis that, is, that has come upon us. I am actually going to start, however, by just rewinding the clock um, three, three, four months um, to when we were in very much a different investment landscape. Um, we went into 2020 with markets in um, almost euphoric mood. There was a really bullish um, um, sentiment amongst investors, and that was for a variety of reasons. Central banks had turned dovish. They'd started to uh, stop talking about monetary policy tightening. There was more there was talk of rate cuts possibly coming down the line, um, and that gave markets a lot of relief. Um, Recession had occupied a lot of investors' minds over 2019, and particularly the last quarter of 2018. Um, but by the time we got to the end of the year, partly because of what central banks had been saying, 
people really thought we were only going to get a recession in the US, um, maybe 2021, 2022. How much, how much has changed in such a short period of time? Um, US-China relations, which had also caused um, investors cause for concern, um, they had shown some signs of improving, nothing comprehensive, but some progress had been made on in trade talks. That had cheered investors. And closer to home, slightly parochial issue from a global markets perspective, but for UK investors, it looked like we'd made some progress uh, with Brexit, which had weighed everyone down and weighed down the UK market throughout 2019. So going into 2020, investors were extremely upbeat. Uh, at Matty Woods, we were still quite cautious. Um, we weren't really buying the story that um, the kind of euphoric attitude was in, in any way justified, if it ever is. We looked at financial markets and basically saw valuations high across all asset classes, whether it be equities, fixed income um, or other asset classes. And that's really a function of what central banks have done over the last 10 years since the financial crisis, or should I call it the last financial crisis now, given what we're going through. Um, so we, there was very little value out there as far as we were concerned that justified the, the, the ongoing um, sentiment. Economic data was showing weakness. This is partly why the central banks had turned course, but we were seeing significantly weak data from China, also pockets of weakness in the US. And there was, a, there was some seriously worrying stuff coming out of, out of Europe as well. And obviously the UK had been affected by um, the, the Brexit issue. Um, and also a function of what central banks had done in the last decade was, was where, where debt was. You know, we looked at debt levels across the globe. Um, wherever you looked, you know, it's, it's elevated, um, but particularly areas in, in of the corporate debt markets, particularly in the U US. And we looked at those levels and we, we thought eventually there was going to have to be some kind of reckoning. So we were prepared for things maybe not to go as smoothly as other investors had been. Now, it's fair to say that we didn't anticipate uh, COVID-19. Um, I may have briefly lost connection there. Apologies if you couldn't hear me. Um, but the complacency which um, we thought um, a lot of investors were under um, was shattered really um, about a month ago as this virus um, came out of China and made its way um, around the globe. Um, you'll all be following the news um, probably as obsessively as we are. Um, you know, we are in a situation now where major economies across the globe are in lockdown and populations in varying degrees in quarantine. The last figures I saw estimated that um, those countries that were in lockdown or quarantine mode across the world accounted for about 70 percent, 70 percent of global GDP. You know, this is an unprecedented situation, certainly outside of outside of wartime, I would say. Um, the financial markets were very, very quick to immediately price in what this meant. And they looked at what was happening and immediately said, this is going to cause a recession in the US and very probably a global recession as well. And asset markets moved accordingly. You know, arguably they were even at one point pricing the possibility when we were in real free fall a few weeks ago of this resulting in a depression. Um, and let's, let's, not, let's not beat around the bush. The economic data which comes out of these for this quarter and next is going to be horrific. Uh, the uh, unemployment data that came out of the US the other day was shocking, I think, even though we expected it to be bad. You know, we're going to see bad um, data prints across the board uh, for the foreseeable. Um, company earnings are going to be massively down. Um, I think 30 to 40 percent was the estimate of the impact it would have on US um, earnings uh, per share um, in, in, in the immediate future. So it's going to be bad. Now, obviously, the point is markets look forward. Uh, they'll take into account the fact that the data is going to be bad. So it's a question of whether it's worse than expectations, same as expectations or better than expectations uh, to determine where markets go from here. Um, what we have seen, of course, is overwhelming uh, policy support from central banks and governments across the globe. Uh, they cannot be accused of not throwing absolutely everything at this problem, which I've obviously indicates the extent of this crisis. Um, they're extremely worried and justifiably so. Um, central banks across the world have all cut interest rates. Um, obviously, if we look um, to the US, they've done much more. They've slashed interest rates to pretty much zero. Um, they've provided huge amounts of liquidity support uh, to the economy and financial markets. 
um, and on the on the uh, not just on the monetary policy side, but actually the U.S. government, of course, has been involved in actually providing support um, in very very direct ways to business, um, uh, and even sending checks to U.S. households because of the um, impact that um, rising unemployment is going to have on the U.S. economy. We've seen very similar measures um, in the U.K. as well, uh, both in terms of monetary policy and on the and on the um, uh, the, the taxation side and on the fiscal side as well. Um, and most of these measures have been greeted well by the markets, and I think it can be said that they've stabilised things for now. Obviously, we're speaking on a day when equity markets are under a bit of sustained pressure, uh, but they have provided some stabilisation, which is reassuring. But the, you know, how effective these measures will prove to be, we're going to find out. Um, so the final point on that slide really is about the vulnerabilities I talked about. You know, there were tensions in these financial markets. Um, you know, we weren't living through sort of a halcyon period, there were issues which were going to have to be addressed. And what this has brought out is problems uh, for companies um, and governments to a degree where, um, you know, if you are, if you have large amounts of debt or there's large amounts of leverage in your business model, you know, you come under massive amounts of pressure because it looks like we're going, we, we are going to go into a recessionary conditions. And those pockets of financial markets where there is illiquidity, uh, particularly elements of the corporate bond market, they've come under pressure as well. So what coronavirus has done is completely idiosyncratic risk. Uh, Simon will touch on, on how this is very much a black swan later on, I think. Um, but um, some of the weaknesses in financial markets have kind of been brought to the fore by it. Um, it has not caused everything. Um, so I suppose the next question is, where are we going to go from here? What is going to happen next? So the three possibilities really are, um, First one, further deterioration in news flow. What might that look like? It might look like a pickup in infection rates, perhaps the mortality rates higher than expected. Perhaps we get second waves of infections and virus outbreaks in parts of the globe where they thought things were improving, maybe now, maybe later in the year. Um, what certainly won't help is many press conferences um, like the one from the White House yesterday where you know some serious numbers of deaths were being bandied around between 100 and 240,000 that has infected uh, sentiment and that's why the markets are, are largely off um, today. There's a possibility that infection rates will broadly stabilise, things will go kind of how the scientists say that they're going to go from here and that will probably mean that you know markets you know can at least take a breather. Uh, the third option of course is that this containment strategy uh, works, uh, we can basically go into lockdown for a period and then we can all get back to business. Um, I think the, the, the real possibility um, at, from, from what I've heard at the moment is that, you know, we go into a lockdown, we come out of it and then we have another lockdown. We have kind of managed series, which I don't think the markets would be prepared for. Um, and however callous it sounds, a positive piece of news flow for these markets would probably be uh, policymakers looking at the economic impact that the measures were having and deciding, do you know what, although health is ultimately everyone's priority, um, there is a trade-off here and we're going to have to try and almost gamble and see what normality uh, does to this situation because obviously there are some health consequences to imposing lockdown on people, whether it's mental or physical. Um, and we don't know which of those, you know, which of those things is going to transpire at the current time. We're all watching the news. Um, which of the outcomes we get will determine how the policy response to date has been seen. If we get further deterioration in news flow, I don't think what's happened so far is going to be deemed sufficient. We are going to see more. We're starting to see talk about what's called phase four, which is a massive infrastructure sperm project in the US. Um, and really, the policymakers are just trying to satisfy the markets all the time. Arguably, we shouldn't be in this situation, but the financial markets are incredibly important to what happens in the real economy more now than they ever have been. And, um, you know, they're not going to want to disappoint the markets. But will they have done enough if the news flow deteriorates from here? Not, not yet, I don't think. If we get the other two possibilities, some stabilisation or even dramatic improvement, maybe we even get a vaccine later in the year. I think we've then got the, the scope of markets really rallying very, very hard. And it's one of the reasons why we've not wanted to remove huge amounts of risks from the portfolio because we don't want to miss up if we think there's a reasonable chance of a, you know, and a very aggressive recovery in asset prices. That brings me to the final point on the slide, really. What kind of recovery are we going to get both for the real economy in inverted commas and for financial markets? Uh, are we going to get a V-shaped recovery? The media is obsessed with all these different, um, um, this terminology at the moment. Is it going to be V-shaped? 
big rapid fall we've seen, but a rapid recovery. Will we sort of balance out for a while, steady out and then see a rapid recovery, a U-shape? Will we recover very aggressively, like in the V-shaped scenario, then fall away again and then recover like in a W scenario? Or will it be a protracted, drawn out downturn, more of a sort of L-shaped recovery? I suppose that wouldn't be much of a recovery at all, would it, if it was an L-shape? Um, maybe, maybe, maybe we need a different name for that. Um, so we don't know. We're all watching the news uh, and absorbing as much information as we, as we possibly can. So perhaps most importantly, what are we doing in portfolios? Well, the first point that I'd like to make is that our portfolios are not, quote, the equity markets. They, they, obviously, they contain equities in them. Uh, but when you see that equity market X around the world has fallen by, you know, Y percent, that is not the story about what our portfolios are doing. Our portfolios are diversified by both asset class and within asset classes, not just about equities. Um, just to reiterate the point, we went into this crisis, let's make no mistake about it, That's, this is what it is, it is a fully blown financial crisis, we went in already cautiously positioned. Um, I've highlighted some of the reasons for that um, earlier on in the presentation. Our portfolios, obviously they contain growth oriented assets and they're affected in these periods, but they also contain a lot of protective assets in portfolios, healthy exposure to US treasuries, um, exposure to gold, um, lots of exposure to alternative strategies um, and also some of the defensive uh, some of the equities that we have there are actually quite defensive in nature things like global insurance and healthcare as well um, so the truth is we haven't done a huge amount given how we were already positioned we have made some minor relatively minor changes um, we've made some reductions to what we think are vulnerable areas of the bond market corporate bonds in the um, across the world and in the US so we've reduced investment grade on um, illiquidity concerns, on liquidity concerns, and also high yields where we, we don't want too much exposure, if any, because of the, I mean, in fact, we are going to go into a recessionary environment and there are liquidity problems in that market as well. If we, want, if, we, if we want to get out of an asset class, we want to guarantee that we can get out and then we're not going to get stuck in because everyone's trying to get out at the same time. And the final point really is that fundamentally we are investing for the long term. Hopefully this is going to be a short-lived crisis and we don't want to completely change the structure of our portfolios, um, you know, just on a short-term basis and potentially miss out on a very rapid recovery, which we, th we still think could happen. Um, but it has to be said that if we do think we need to take um, more substantial or even drastic action, then we will do. Whether that means adding more risk in because the outlook improves or whether it means actually taking more risk out of the portfolio to protect clients. And that's the end of the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Uh, thanks for your input. So I'd like to now um, pass on to our colleague, Richard Shepherd cross Richard is uh, the Managing Director of Custodian Capital, and uh, he's going to talk about property. We are undoubtedly, as you've just heard, in pretty extraordinary times. Nowhere has this felt more than in corporate and therefore indeed in personal incomes. So I'll hand over to Richard, who will talk about property and indeed income. Richard. Thank you, Simon, and good morning, uh, everybody. Um, I think the, the first thing to say, um, uh, clearly I'm talking about uh, property this morning, is that um, from our perspective, uh, custodian REIT uh, arrives at this COVID-19 crisis in uh, strong financial health and with a defensive uh, investment strategy. So we are, I hope, well placed to deal with uh, the challenges ahead. I, I apologise for the slides jumping around. Um, it's the change of operator and we will very quickly catch up. The question is, what has the impact uh, of COVID-19 been on commercial property? I think the first thing to say is that broadly across markets, both investors and occupiers have stopped uh, uh, an awful lot of transactions. So we are seeing fewer um, occupiers taking new leases. We're seeing fewer investors um, committing to new transactions. And most businesses are focused on preserving cash flow at the moment. So not investing that money, not committing that money, uh, but, but retaining it. 
there's clearly been uh, a very obvious negative impact on consumer facing real estate. So most particularly, I'm thinking there about retail, hospitality sector, uh, and leisure sector. And those tenants are facing uh, real challenges in their business. And one of the things that they have opted to do is to defer rental payments. And indeed, the government is supporting this in so far as they have said that landlords cannot evict tenants for non-payment of this quarter's rent. And that is probably uh, a very sensible approach. It's important to say that rent is being deferred. There is no suggestion that rent isn't due. Indeed, uh, that it won't be paid in the long term. But in order to protect short term cash flows, tenants are electing to retain that rent. In our case, we have spoken to every tenant in our portfolio, many of whom have paid, some who are looking for deferrals and putting in place uh, a plan to ensure that we recover uh, all of that rent due over the medium term. I think we should also expect to see a negative impact on valuations. Now, it is very early uh, to uh, see if that is actually going to happen. There haven't been sufficient transactions in the market to uh, demonstrate a meaningful movement in valuations, but I think to see a shift in values on retail, hospitality and leisure sectors would not be surprising. But by contrast, we've seen that food retailers are doing well, pharmacies are doing well, a lot of the online delivery businesses are doing well. So it's by no means bad news uh, across the market. <coughs> we've also seen, for those of you who avidly watch uh, the stock market, and as Richard Smith uh, hinted at a little earlier, a very sharp movement in share prices. And the real estate hasn't been immune to that. We saw a very sharp uh, a correction um, downwards in real estate stock prices as investors prioritized holding cash and tried to find liquidity in the market uh, wherever it was available. And this created a period of short-term, fairly extreme volatility, where uh, across all um, real estate stocks, values, share values fell by as much as 50%. But within 10 days, <clears throat> most of those had recovered by uh, about, to, to about uh, 30, 35% down from where they started. So quite a period of volatility. But that liquidity that was um, a feature of the market, incredibly important for those invested in real estate. And it's worth <coughs> pointing out at this stage that investors need to be very conscious of the liquidity conundrum, or indeed the liquidity con that is offered by UK property funds who have all suspended. Now, these are not listed property companies. These are the open-ended property funds, the unit trusts. Their valuers have um, qualified all valuations as being materially uncertain. And that is not to say the values are falling, although they might, but it just that there isn't sufficient evidence in the market for valuers to uh, really nail their colors to the mast with a firm valuation. The impact of that material uncertainty is that under the FCA uh, Financial Conduct Authority's guidance, they are required to suspend trading. And as Mark Carney um, said, uh, while he was still Bank of uh, England governor, these daily dealing open-ended funds investing in, in illiquid assets, such as property, were built on a lie. And that lie, is one of liquidity. We saw suspensions in 2008, in 2016, last year, and now again with COVID-19. But it's really important to understand the difference between those open-ended, apparently daily traded fund structures 
and property companies, investment trusts, real estate investment trusts, which remain open for business. And they demonstrated very real liquidity for uh, availability for investors over the last uh, few weeks. Of course, the price of liquidity is volatility and volatility of share price. And as I said, we've seen that you know, down 50% and, and, uh, and back up. Not back up to where we started, but back up significantly from where prices were. So how does custodian REIT fit into uh, all of this? I think the first and most important thing to say is that we have a defensive investment strategy. Defensive because it is uh, spread across 250 or more tenants. It is spread uh, across 161 properties, geographically diverse, spread between the different sectors um, with a large proportion of our portfolio, 44% in industrial and logistics, 9% in offices. These two sectors much less likely to be hit by COVID-19 uh, troubles. Uh, and clearly we have exposure to, uh, to retail and, and retail warehousing. But many of those uh, occupiers are in, uh, we, you know, are in sectors such as food or um, discounters or homewares who haven't been suffering quite the problems of the fashion retailers who make up a very small part of our portfolio. And I think what COVID-19 is doing is accelerating a process that was happening anyway. We were seeing um, retail, the retail environment change dramatically. And I think COVID-19 is going to shake that out a little bit further. But fundamentally, that diverse income base, when allied to a defensive financial structure, uh, should give, I hope, uh, investors a great deal of comfort as we go into these difficult markets. And how does that financial structure look? We have a loan to value of only 22.5% and a, a banking covenant at 35%, so that's our, our loan to value limit, uh, which gives us uh, a significant headroom. We have no short-term refinancing risk. The average term of our debt is seven years. We have cash reserves and undrawn debt facilities we can use to support the business or indeed to support our tenants' cash flow through uh, the COVID-19 lockdown period. We go into the period with, based on contractual rent, fully covered dividends, and very importantly, we have a supportive shareholder base. And that um, uh, has really uh, shown um, a difference when we compare it to our, our, our peer group uh, over the last few weeks. While they also have, on average, uh, low loan to values, 25%, they also have cash reserves and secure debt, but they saw much greater volatility. So while the market fell about 50% in the share price, uh, custodian REIT fell back only 35% and has recovered uh, to about 11% of where it was and sitting at about a 7% discount to the net asset value, the underlying value of the assets. And it probably just worth finishing on pointing out some of the support that the government has given, which um, feeds through to the real estate sector. Firstly, they have taken away business rates for all retail, hospitality and leisure properties for the next 12 months. Typically, business rates are about uh, the same um, in, in terms of quantum as rent. So that creates more space in um, our tenants cash flow to pay rent. They have a given tenants effective immunity from eviction for non-payment of rent. So that might mean that we have a slightly more uh, involved process in collecting that rent, but it is still due. And finally, the Bank of England, again, has been mentioned, dropping interest rates to 0.1%, clearly supportive to businesses currently. But I think um, it will also mean that when we come out of COVID-19, which surely we will, with very low interest rates and a continued low return environment, real assets uh, with contractual income and relatively high levels of dividend are still going to be an important part of our clients' portfolios. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Richard. And uh, again, thank you to everybody for uh, bearing with us through uh, this, which is our first live webinar. Uh, hopefully you're able to pick up everything everyone's saying and indeed see the slides. If you do have questions, please do uh, ask those questions uh, via the route that Joe highlighted earlier, and we will take a few of them uh, before we finish, and we will make sure that we answer all of them subsequently for, for all of you who are on the call. So again, thank you very much for your patience. Uh, Richard referred earlier on to black swan events and uh, whilst uh, the very nature of a black swan is that it is unexpected, uh, what a lot of people seem to forget is it's not just an unexpected event but it is one which has severe consequences and I think it is fair to say that uh, the idea of COVID-19 which only first uh, emerged uh, for the globe right at the end of December uh, is something that has caught most people by surprise. I'd just like to talk a little about uh, what's been going on and then look a little ahead as to what we might expect before stopping for time for some questions. We've seen some record surges, the US market up uh, more than 8% one day last week. Those uh, record rises are very unexpected, they are unusual, they're almost black swan events in themselves and they usually follow rapid falls. It's also important to know that they very rarely signal the bottom of a market. 1929, 31, 32, 33, 1987, 2008 and 2020 were all bear markets. They are the only occasions the US stock market has ever grown by more than 8% in a day. And on only one of those occasions was that actually the signal of the bottom, on none of the others was that the signal of the bottom. Something else to look out for, uh, we refer to it as Dr. Copper in investment circumstances, but so the price of copper, which is linked to the health of the global economy, that's quite a, a regular candidate for a, an indicator of, of where things are, has recently fallen to four-year lows. Uh, it is trundling along at the moment. It doesn't look as if it's got another sharp spike either direction. But if one felt that one had seen the, the low price for copper, that may be an indication that things were about to turn round. In a similar way, uh, we've got to think about the oil price. And at the moment, we are suffering both a supply and a demand shock. And that is what is causing the issues with the oil price. Hit a 16-year low a couple of days ago. Uh, it is going to be very difficult to try and judge that. Uh, it's also um, not unexpected given what's happening from the demand perspective. And we're aware of what's been happening with the supply, with the conversations between Russia and Saudi Arabia, which were now a few weeks ago. I think whenever we think uh, about prices in these sort of markets for equities and other uh, assets that are daily or relatively regularly priced, we should perhaps take the retail sale in mind. Imagine, if you will, that, uh, that I'm going out to, to shop for a suit. The first day of the sale may be very attractive, but actually usually the sale prices will fall further and there's a better day to buy. We may be in that environment now, who knows, but it's rarely appropriate to try and wait for the very last day of the sale because frankly, if I do that, I can never go and find a suit that will actually fit me. Nothing is suited to me if we wait quite that long. So it is a very difficult judgment in these circumstances, but during the sale rather than right at the end is probably the point to try to get back in, in, involved. And from an investor's perspective, that's probably the answer. Uh, it's very important to talk about security of client assets. Richard's talked about assets falling. Richard Smith has alluded to that as well. Everybody will know that uh, they've probably had 10% uh, letters or emails letting them, letting them know that their, uh, their portfolio has fallen 10% since their last quarterly valuation. But the security of clients asset is paramount and the various firms that we use, not least Pershing, for example, where most of the multi asset type funds are held, uh, we have great deal of security. That doesn't mean your funds can't go up and down in value, but the security of them in the background we're very, very comfortable with. And I really wanted to pass that on to people today. We may see inflation as a threat. Uh, I don't know if anyone's got any questions about that, but if you have, we'll maybe take one of those if, if anyone's got an inflation question. Uh, and I just want to finish, so we've got time for some questions with three points about three of the areas that we'd like historically and why we still like them. The first is healthcare. This may be blindingly obvious, but we think an increase in government spending around the world, particularly in the UK, but actually elsewhere, will have political and public support. It won't be hit in the way that sometimes political ideas are. They'll be spending on equipment. They'll be spending on face masks, advanced technology, diagnostic testing, which we know is key in managing pandemics, and biotech will probably flourish. Uh, for technology perspective, uh, the communications element of technology is having, if it's something I'm allowed to say, a good crisis so far, social media apps, contact via government and regulators, uh, the NHS uh, sending texts out to people has all been very positive and very well received. I think Silicon Valley has been seen to 
uh, cooperate in removing some of the fake news that's around, primarily in America, but also elsewhere. And of course, there'll be new hospitals, which will mean thousands more computers and IT services. From an infrastructure perspective, the third and final element of, uh, of the themes that, that we, we've liked historically and, and we think will continue to do well. Again, as the Chancellor has said in the UK, there will be infrastructure spending, but that's very much taken a, a back seat while we deal with the health emergency that we're in. Uh, spending on hospital buildings in the UK and Northern Europe, uh, other wealthy countries where they need to increase their capacity after a decade of fiscal austerity, there will undoubtedly be a lot of spending. Uh, stimulus packages for road, rail, bridges and the like will probably come through and again will probably get broad public as well as government approval. The one area to look at perhaps is uh, areas like flights and some of the other travel related areas of infrastructure. Will people want to take quite so many discretionary flights? Will they fly as often as they did? And that's an area that one would have to keep an, a close eye on. As Richard Smith alluded to earlier on, we will only make changes in portfolios that we think suit the long term outcome for clients, even if they are tactical. Uh, these market conditions are brutal and if you get the wrong side of two days of an up market or two days of a down market, you can be 10, 12, 14% off depending on which judgment you made. That's not uh, an area where we want to be making big, significant and rapid investment decisions. I'd just like to quickly end before we take the questions and, and Joe will have those ready for us, I'm sure, to say that even though um, we are apart we will get this get through this together this is a line that came from a care home email just the other day and i think it it fits very well even though we're apart we will get through this together joe let's uh, let's hear from you with any questions if we can please yes thank you to the investment team we've had quite a few questions so for those that we don't address in this webinar we will address in our frequently asked questions so please be assured they will be addressed. So the first one I've got is from Dennis. Um, I think it would be good to mention the level of withdrawals from funds and whether this is causing any concern at the moment. Simon, can you address that question? From yes, uh, thank you, Dennis. That's a, that's a very fair question. Um, we, we we can't tell what's happening uh, elsewhere uh, in the financial world. This hasn't uh, been a figure that's come out a lot, but we can tell you that within our own multi-asset funds, which have been stood at around about uh, 1.3, 1.4 billion of assets, we've had around about 7 million of withdrawals thus far. So that's not a significant amount. I think because as most of you who are on the webinar will know, you've you're got a consultant-led relationship because you'll be talking to the consultants because I think most investors do understand the long-term nature of investing other than those that uh, maybe have some urgency uh, for, for the capital uh, there haven't been significant withdrawals and uh, I don't think I'd expect to see significant withdrawals from this stage and if I could make the next question to Richard Shepherd Cross so in light of the current pandemic are we looking at divesting any of the properties or buying new ones at a bargain and that's from Gamel to Richard Shepherd Cross. Uh, I think um, that, 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 it, that is um, perhaps early to answer that certainly we are not planning to sell any properties into the current market um, we do have uh, one uh, property which we have had under offer for some time. It's a special purchaser situation. Uh, as for bargains, we are well funded to take advantage of bargains if or when they appear. But at this stage, there is little to uh, that we can hang our hat on that tells us that values are going to fall uh, sufficiently to create those bargains. But when they come along, we are uh, ready to take advantage of those opportunities. Thank you, Richard. Um, we've had a question in from John and Lucy. Uh, it's around, um, are cheap Asian stocks worth a look at the moment? Is now the time to buy shares in general? And I think that's best pitched to Richard Smith. Okay, thanks, Joe. Uh, well, just, uh, I suppose on the, on, the, on, the, on the general, is it time to buy shares? I mean, we have not made any additions or reductions to our um, equity allocations in portfolios um, so the current state of our portfolios is you know and the percentages we're allocating in the various areas indicates where we think um, one should be invested on a on, on a long-term basis uh, we don't feel it's the time to be brave and add more equity risk at the current time 
um, I think it's fair to say. On the on the Asian shares point of view, um, you know, Asia is an area that we do like. Um, you know, employing our long term perspective, um, lots of things in its favour in terms of you know lower debt and, and demographics and things like that. Um, meaning they've got um, you know things things in their favour over the long run. Um, you say you, you know, the questioner refers to you know cheap Asian shares. I mean, you've always got to be careful of stuff that's cheap. It's usually often cheap for a reason. There is obviously uh, there are pockets of value out there, but I mean Asia is obviously a, a, a huge region, and you, you'll get to cheap air, cheaper areas like China and South Korea, places like that. And then you'll get expensive areas, you know, sort of I don't know, India and Malaysia tend to be a bit more highly valued. So it's a very um, you know heterogeneous. Uh, region, um, but we do have healthy Asian allocations in portfolios, it's fair to say. I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Richard. Now we are closing to the end of our webinar, so I'm just going to quickly um, pitch one more question. Simon, how low can the oil price go? Huh. Oh, that's a very good question, uh, whoever said that. Uh, it, it can probably go lower. There are predictions that it could go down to um, to half where it is now. Nevertheless, uh, there will come a point where uh, economic growth comes back into global economies, and that will see uh, uh, governments with infrastructure product uh, pro projects. It will see individuals getting back in their cars, uh, lorries probably doing more journeys than they've been doing and all the things that tend to, to drive the demand side. The supply side is a slightly more difficult one to see. Uh, the Russians and Saudi Arabia are having a standoff right now. There's a suggestion that uh, Saudi Arabia maybe cost them five dollars to to produce a barrel of oil a bit more to actually get it out there but just to produce it russia's figure is is a little bit more than that and there's another suggestion from a, a report i looked at recently that suggests that the russian government would probably cope with oil at about 30 dollars a barrel for four or five years given uh, various of the, the the functions they have in the background uh, i don't think we we see uh, oil at $100 a barrel anytime soon, but whether it uh, can fall a lot further is uh, is also perhaps uh, unlikely. I think it, it may be settling towards a, towards a floor, but uh, as with all things right now, it, it could go lower as, as the news uh, we think probably gets worse in the short term. Thank you to all of the investment team today. Thank you for joining us on this webinar. That brings us uh, to the end of our time together. But um, we look forward to speaking with you again soon. Thank you.